Before we begin, can I remind members and witnesses to make sure their mobile phones are turned off, please? Uh, we're here today to discuss the welcome from the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine, Dr. Cecil Beamish, Assistant Secretary General, Ms. Josephine Kelly, Principal Officer, Mr. Colin O'Sullivan, Assistant Principal, and uh, thank you for coming before the committee today to discuss uh, the scrutiny of the UL's proposals relating to COM 21948 and COM 21949. Uh, COM 21948 has proposed regulation of the European Parliament and of the Council amending Regulation EU No. 508 of 2014 as regards certain rules relating to the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund by reason of the withdrawal of the United Kingdom from the Union and uh, come to 1949 is proposed a regulation of European Parliament, the Council amending regulation in EU 217 2403 as regards fishing authorisations for the Union of fishing vessels in the United Kingdom waters and fishing opportunities operations sorry, of United Kingdom fishing vessels in Union, Union waters. Uh, before I begin, I want to bring your attention to the issue of privilege. Uh, witnesses are protected by absolute privilege in respect of evidence you are to give to the committee. However, if you are directed by the committee to cease giving evidence in relation to a particular matter and you continue to do so, you are entitled thereafter to qualify privilege in respect of your evidence. You are directed that only evidence connected with the subject matter, subject matter of these proceedings be given and you are asked to respect the parliamentary practice to the fact that, where possible, you should not criticise or make charges against any person mentioned by name to, uh, to make him or her identifiable. Members are reminded of long style and parliamentary practice to the fact that members should not comment on, criticise or make charges against either a person outside the House or an official leader by name in such ways to make him or her identifiable. Uh, Dr Beamish, I understand now you're going to uh, give us a briefing on the issue so far as we requested last week. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you very much, Chairman, um, and thanks for the opportunity to address the committee to discuss the recent proposals from the European Commission with regard to fisheries, uh, which is a sector of the economy that's uniquely exposed to the negative implications of a no-deal or disorderly Brexit. Under the transition period as set down in the withdrawal agreement agreed between the UK Government and the EU, there would be no change to the current situation of fishing during the transition period up to the end of uh, 2020. Uh, the Government's position is that it hopes that a no-deal scenario can still be avoided uh, and that the withdrawal agreement uh, can be concluded with the United Kingdom, but it must also be prepared for all possibilities. On the 30th of March 2019, if the UK leaves the European Union without agreement, it also automatically leaves the Common Fisheries Policy, or the CFP as we know it. The UK will then become a third country or coastal state in its own right under the United Nations Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLOS. The UK would, if it so choose, chose, be able to immediately close its waters to the EU vessels. This would mean that the status quo in which Irish vessels can freely fish in many areas of the United Kingdom's exclusive economic zone, their EZ, and vice versa, could be altered immediately. On the issue of access to waters, there has been no clear, unequivocal message from the United Kingdom Government. Secretary of State Gove made a remark last October that could be interpreted as meaning that the status quo on both access and quota would continue for 2019, even in the event of a no-deal Brexit. However, much has changed since October. The UK Government's guidance note on the fisheries sector and preparing for EU exit, published on the 1st of March 2019, says that access to waters will change if the UK leaves the EU without a deal, and that non-UK vessels will no longer have the automatic right to fish in UK waters. While the position on access is not clear. The possibility that all EU vessels, and hence all Irish vessels, would be excluded from the UK zone in the event of a no-deal Brexit is certainly one possible scenario. In the context of that, that possible scenario, the Commission has put forward two separate technical proposals relating to fisheries. Under the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, it is possible under certain limited circumstances at present to provide temporary financial aid to vessels for the cessation of fishing activities for a period of time. The purpose of the Commission proposal uh, is to amend the EU regulation for the European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, the EMFF, to widen those circumstances to cover vessels that would be significantly impacted due to their exclusion from UK waters. There are limits on to how much fishing effort could be redirected from the UK waters to EU waters for many reasons, including the sustainability of fish stocks and the cost effectiveness of vessels 
and the quality of catches. <clears throat> the aid under the EMFF would be available for a maximum of nine months over the period to the end of 2020. The EU Commission position is that the funds would have to be with, found from within the existing Member States EMFF envelope. This loosening of the rules around temporary cessation of financial aid is a limited measure that, while welcome in the event that it might have to be availed of, would not address all of the issues that would arise from loss of access to UK waters. Perhaps most importantly, it provides the legal framework in which to provide possible tie-up aid to fishing vessels affected. Minister Creed has made it clear that in the event that a tie-up measure is required, it will be essential to ensure a coordinated and balanced application of a scheme to individual fisheries across the fleets of the member states involved. Ireland is working closely and intensively with the other member states most concerned and with the European Commission's DG Mare to identify the potential impacts for fishing that would arise from displacement of fishing activity in the event of no deal Brexit and loss of access. The second proposal from the European Commission is similarly about ensuring that there is a legal basis to allow EU vessels to operate in the waters of a third country in the absence of a formal agreement between the EU and that third country. That second proposal also provides for the possibility of current quota swapping arrangements between EU member states and the UK to continue in the absence of an agreement. This proposal does not mean that there will be ongoing reciprocal access after March 29th. It merely provides the legal basis for it to happen should the UK be willing to grant such reciprocal access in a no-deal situation. Um, <clears throat> in relation to the timing on adoption of these two proposals, the two proposals are proceeding on a fast-track procedure through the Council and the European Parliament. A plenary EU Parliament vote is scheduled for the 13th of March and is expected that the Council's final endorsement will happen around the 18th or 19th of March, so that they are legally in place before the 29th. Um, <clears throat> the impact of the loss of access uh, for the Irish fleet is a critical issue. Uh, Ireland, France, Denmark, Germany, Belgium and the Netherlands all take on average between 30 and 45 per cent of their landings by volume, and 18 and a half per cent and 50 per cent by value from UK waters. Of the UK's total landings, only 15% by volume are caught outside the UK, EZ. On average, 34% of Irish landings by volume and value came from inside the UK, EZ. Ireland catches a proportion of all our main commercial quotas, that's 30 plus stocks, in UK waters. And in some cases, such as macro, which is our largest fishery, well over 60% of the quota is taken from UK waters. The most immediate impact of loss of access would be for our whitefish and prawn fisheries. This is because our pelagic fisheries, in particular mackerel, would not be immediately affected um, in 2019, as our fleet has largely caught the available quota in the early part of the year. This situation of concentration of fishing in a small period could have adverse impacts though, on our processing companies later on. Irish vessels. Uh, in the event of, of being excluded from UK waters, Irish vessels would lose access to parts of the important nephrops or prawn grounds in the Irish Sea and in the important smalls grounds situated off Milford Haven. It would also lose access to parts of the Celtic Sea that come within the UK zone, with important fishing grounds there for mixed demersal species such as cod, haddock, whiting, monkfish, megrum and hake. It would fully lose access to the fishing grounds around Rockall, off the west coast of Scotland. A major knock-on effect of loss of access by Irish and other Union vessels in the event of a disorderly Brexit is the likely increase in activity in the fishing grounds in the waters around Ireland. The concern here is an increase in pressure on fish stocks in particular fishing grounds leading to an increase in fish mortality on those grounds. This in turn could threaten the long-term sustainability of those stocks resulting in lower quotas going forward. It is in that context that temporary tie-up of vessels may be required to protect the long-term sustainability of the stocks upon which our fleets rely. Minister Creed has made it clear that if there has to be any temporary cessation, its use must be proportionate across the EU fleets 
fishing in these shared fisheries. It cannot be the case that in shared fisheries, the vessels of one member state are tied up while the vessels of another continue to fish without uh, restriction. The Minister has made clear that there must be a level playing field for all those impacted by loss of access to UK waters. In relation to preparedness, um, the Irish response is and will continue to be within the overall EU27 context, and in particular the group of eight member states directly impacted for fisheries. Minister Creed met with uh, Fisheries Commissioner Vella on the 18th of February to discuss these issues uh, and the ongoing work of ensuring a coordinated response at EU level. There have been a number of other meetings at official level with the group of eight member states and the Commission, and that work is ongoing. Displacement of other EU fleets into the limited remaining fishing grounds in Western waters must be planned for, and measures taken at European level to ensure that we have an orderly activity within sustainable levels. Those meetings between the group of eight member states and the Commission are focused on ensuring that there will be an EU coordination mechanism on the actual application of any temporary cessation. Work is ongoing on identifying fleets and stocks most vulnerable to a disorderly Brexit and exploring possible mitigation arrangements within temporary cessation schemes. At national level, Minister Creed has continued to work closely with industry representatives. The most recent meeting was on 25th of February in Clonakilty, where the Minister and the industry representatives had a full exchange on the evolving situation on Brexit. Within the Department and the Marine Agencies, there has been intensive work to prepare for all possible scenarios. The State is providing advice and information on importing and exporting issues in a situation of an audio Brexit. The Sea Fisheries Protection Authority is holding a number of information events for traders. Information notices are available on their website, as well as notices being published on the Department of Agriculture, Food and Marine website and the Departments of Foreign Affairs and Trade websites. BIM, Borbia and Enterprise Ireland are continuing to work with seafood companies to help them to deal with Brexit, seeking to make them more competitive and diversify market exposure. Support is also given to upskill teams. In terms of seafood processing uh, and readiness for breakfast, bre Brexit, <laughs> sorry, uh, there are a number, a total of 163 seafood processing companies operating in Ireland. Of these, 53% generate less than a million in annual revenue. 32% of these are made up of companies which are in the 1 to 10 million bracket, while the remaining 15% are in the greater than 10 million bracket. Exports of seafood from Ireland in 2017 totaled 314,000 tonnes, worth 666 million euro. The EU is the main market for these exports particularly the shellfish, salmonid and whitefish seafood categories. The UK market is significant, it's worth 86 million in 2017 with a volume of 44,000 tonnes. BIM have been working extensively with the sector to determine the extent of and offer, the extent of impact and the offer advice on readiness for Brexit. There remains a high level of uncertainty as to the landscape for businesses post-Brexit. While some of the seafood processing companies are prepared to a high degree for Brexit, the majority are prepared to a limited extent, and some are unprepared. BIM, Enterprise Ireland and Borbia will continue to work with these companies to strengthen all aspects of their preparations. On the trade issues, in general the seafood sector shares many of the concerns of other sectors with regard to currency fluctuations, tariffs and the land bridge. There are, however, a number of additional issues for seafood. A no-deal Brexit will mean that Irish importers and exporters of seafood products to and from the UK will require additional certificates on top of those required for products of animal origins under the uh, sanitary and phytosanitary rules. All seafood imported into the EU from a third country, which the UK will be after it leaves the Union, must have a catch certificate. Uh, the UK is a significant market, 14% of our exports for our seafood uh, but it's not our most important market. While the land bridge is a significant issue for many seafood exporters, it is especially worrying for the seafood exporters given the perishability of their product. On average, we export 26,000 tonnes of seafood via the land bridge each year. Having to go by sea directly to continental Europe would add 12 hours to the journey. 
Again, these are issues with which we are working closely with the sector and the relevant state agencies. In conclusion, a no-deal Brexit, which is not the desired outcome, would have a severe impact on the Irish seafood sector as a whole. Loss of access to UK waters is the most immediate, large-scale threat for the seafood industry. We have a clear, agreed strategy in place at EU level that future fisheries arrangements with the UK can only be agreed within the context of the overall economic relationship. That has not changed throughout the Brexit negotiation process and will remain in case in a no-deal situation. Specifically on fisheries, the agreed overarching priority has been and remains to maintain existing levels of access to waters and resources to provide continuity and certainty to our catching and processing sectors. In the short term, in a worst case scenario, EU emergency aid may be required to allow us to tie up a proportionate part of the EU fleets in the highly impacted fisheries. This can and will only happen in an agreed and coordinated way, thus sending again the very clear message that the EU27 are working as one in fisheries to deliver on an EU priority to maintain status quo in terms of access and quotas. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you very much, Dr. Beebe. The questions uh, for members. Uh, Deputy Pringle was first to indicate. Uh, thanks, Chairman, and thanks, Sir Beebe, for your presentation today. Um, <clears throat> the first, first issue I'd like to just uh, deal with is um, you say that you, you thank us for the opportunity to discuss recent proposals of the European Commission with regard to fisheries and that there, but in response to the committee last week, the department said there was no point in really you coming here to discuss with us because was ha things were happening and were going to happen anyway, um, or that they were happening quickly, and so the timing wouldn't be suitable for us to be here, for you to be here. So I just wondering, in relation to that, um, uh, I think that's a bit worrying that um, a government department would actually take that view, and um, I wonder if you'd explain in relation to to that as to why why that would be the view of the department in, on this matter. Um, okay, I can see that the, these uh, legislative proposals are going to go through fairly quickly in terms of fast tracking. That's not quite factually correct. Uh, I think the line coming back last week was that. Uh, there was negotiations presently ongoing, uh, and at this at that stage it was going to be uh, may not have been of most benefit at that particular moment in time. I don't think what you said now was that factually correct. Well, if that's, well, so that's the case, then that's fair enough. Um, apologies yeah. for that. I, I, I took it that it was that the, it uh, had been done and dusted, basically, and it was going on. No, that's, no, that's, no. The, that's the case. That's the, well, I apologise for that. Yeah, no, but just, just to correct it. Um, so, okay, so just to deal with the actual. Um, Proposals here, um, and just in relation to the potential closure of, e e of British waters, to what would actually be involved, and that would it have to be like obviously on the date if the EU withdraws on the 29th of March without an agreement, their waters would officially probably close. But I just wonder what has to happen in order for that to take effect. Um, uh, if you could ex explain in relation to that. Um, I would just also like to ask then, in relation to payment for, from the existing EMFF for compensation, what, what will the impact of that, that could mean in terms of the projects that are also been funded, looking for funding under the EMFF, and whether there be enough money there in relation to, to actually compensate adequately the uh, fishers and fishery businesses for the, the loss of um, their income in relation to uh, the closure of the uh, UK waters to them. And just wondering if there's any provision within that for compensation of crews, because while the owners of the boats may be compensated, the crew members will actually be out of work. And I'm just wondering, is, it, is that something within your department that you would take a view on? Um, and also, then, uh, the minister, you say that the minister has made it clear that the temporary cessation must be proportionate. I'm just wondering how is he proposing that that works? How is he, how actually, you, you say it there, but I'm just, um, where is it? Uh, minister Green has made it clear that if there's a temporary cessation, it must be used a proportionate across the EU fleets. I'm just wondering what the me mechanism is that's going to work and what actually that will mean in, in effect. Um, in relation to the land bridge, now I understand 
this may not be your concern, but I'm just wondering if you can address it in relation to fisheries exports um, that are going to the EU and using the land bridge. Obviously, they've been sealed in wherever, Kelly Beggs, Green Castle, or any of the ports, and they'll go across. So, uh, the fact that the seal would stay intact, is that enough, or would, in your view, is that, uh, has that been looked at in relation to, your, to yourselves and how that would actually work? Um, I'm just wondering if you have any information on relation to the import tariffs that are applicable to seafood, uh, and do you have those in the, the UK? So, while 14% uh, of exports would be impacted, what actually would be the, the level of impact from, from those stocks? Um, that's all I have at the moment, Chairman. Thanks, Deputy. Uh, Deputy Kenny. Uh, thank you for your, your, your presentation. And um, basically, the, 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 the requirement we have here is in relation to the, um, particularly the compensation of fishermen who would be negatively affected because of Brexit if they're basically frozen out of a large section of water where they, where they traditionally fish and continue to fish and, and, and catch a large portion of their catch. Uh, in respect of that, do you have any um, indication or is it, is it something that the department is getting any indication back from the negotiations in regard to the overall um, situation regarding the common fisheries policy and, and, and what, what arrangement will be in place? Because clearly, like, while whatever happens and Britain leaves and they're, they're, they're going to leave the common fisheries policy, they'll still have to have some arrangement in place. And there'll have to be an arrangement in place between the EU and Britain in respect of access to waters, access to, 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 um, uh, to various docks in different places. Uh, and I just wonder, in respect of that, uh, and particularly when we look at the, the amount of, um, of quota, which will be obviously taken away from the, the British fishers, and where that quota will go. If, the, if, if Britain leaves the EU, they have a portion, they have a portion of quota over there, which at, at the moment they've got, that quota will be coming back into the system. What's going to happen to that? And have we any uh, clarity around that as of yet? Uh, I'd also be interested in, the, in, in regard to the tariffs and the tariff rates which will be in place, and if there's any indication as to how, how long um, or what, what deal can be done around that. Um, also, the other... The other um, section in, in regard to the, the compensation for for, um, for fishermen who would lose out in respect of that. Um, if, if Irish fishermen are going to lose out and, and the vessels are tied up for a period of time because they can't obviously catch, uh, will, the, will it mean that there will be uh, one of the consequences of it that there will be extra competition within what will be the now diminished or, 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 or smaller EU waters as a consequence of, of Brexit and uh, what measures or what new arrangements is possible? Is it possible to go back to the, to the common fisheries policy and look to see what kind of, of new negotiation can happen there? Because for instance we have, the, as we know I think it was last November, the, the, the total allowable catch was set out for this coming year and before the end of this year we could be in a situation where Brexit throws all that up in the air. Is there going to be a a, a new negotiation, sit down again and work it all out again, or, or what, is the, what is the proposal in respect of that? Thank you, Chairman. Thanks, Deputy. Uh, Deputy Conlogue, please. Um, thank you, Chairperson, and thanks to the officials for coming in today. Um, in relation to, just to, if you can give us some further clarity in relation to the carve up of quota between what uh, UK registered vessels would have at the moment um, and other uh, EU member states. Um, what exactly happens there? So, I mean, if there's a hard Brexit and the uh, UK are not willing to do a reciprocal deal uh, in terms of access to um, stocks and access to water, what exactly happens then in relation to the carve up? Or, first of all, what exactly happens in relation to the, the quota that um, UK would have? And also, what happens in relation to the quotas for various fish stocks that the, no, that the other EU member states have? Um, and the process, the process around that. In relation to, um, in the scenario of a tie-up, um, which obviously is, is, would be massively, um, massively disruptive um, and uh, 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 expensive um, and see massive financial loss to the fish sector, in the event of a tie-up, what 
what are your estimations in relation to um, the reduction on fish catches um, uh, overall and then also in terms of the, the fish processing sector? I mean, what are the estimations in relation to the availability of fish uh, to, to, to that sector? Um, similarly to what some of the previous speakers asked in relation to the, um, the funding under the uh, European Maritime and Fisheries Fund, um, and you've indicated in your presentation that, that any funding would have to come from existing national allocations or envelopes. Can you just clarify further what is meant there? Um, and uh, I think cause obviously it would be essential that, that the level of funding that's in place in such an undesirable scenario could properly compensate the physical sector, both fishermen, fish boat owners, and also those, uh, the, the employees, um, in that in, in that eventuality, um, in relation to you, you indicated the importance as well of the land bridge for for fish getting out of the country, and particularly because of the perishable nature of fish, and you indicated that it's, that there would be additional SPS checks required um, to, uh, to on on fish uh, fish products. Um, I know the Minister for Agriculture and the Government had originally, back last summer, announced that there was going to be 300 um, SPS officials um, and veterinary officials hired to be uh, in place to deal with the, event, the, the, the possibility of a hard Brexit. That was then later reduced to 116 back in October. But uh, as things stand, how many, um, what do you, uh, in terms of your awareness of what the situation is with regard to the, the number of SPS personnel that are, have been recruited and would be available for that work, um, um, and uh, if not, exactly what is going to happen in terms of uh, being able to ensuring that, that those checks get carried out and would be carried out in, in a prompt manner. Um, Grimago, Chairperson. Yes, Deputy and Senator Common Watch, please. Thank you, Cahir. Look, I just want to ask you in relation to the change of of mind by uh, the Secretary of State Gove when he made his remarks in October. What changed between October and March for him to um, then say access to waters will change if the UK leaves the EU without a deal um, so that non-UK uh, vessels will no longer have automatic fishing rights? Uh, just what changed? And I just want to ask you, in terms of the impounding of the boats last week, do you think that will have a, a negative effect if the necessary legislation isn't brought in to avoid that happening again? Do you think it will have a negative effect on uh, relations with, the, e, with the, the UK? And just also in terms of the other member states, is it that you envisage that if there's a restriction of the UK waters that the, um, the other member states will then intensively, so all the concentration will be on Irish waters? and the impact of that maybe just in terms of, uh, of quotas. And I suppose it's like my previous colleague asked in terms of the redistribution of the quotas if the UK leave. That's all. Thank Senator, you for your look. Uh, any other members have any questions? Okay, Dr. Yeah. Beamish. Sorry, sorry, Senator. Yeah, thank you, Pat. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I'll be very brief because I know Chair just barely allowed me in. Um, Look, I do think it's an important issue, and this is a doomsday scenario in so many ways, so I do think we just need to clarify that before we actually kind of go into the actual meat of the issue itself. Could I ask about the actual tie-up measures that would be proposed in the event of a hard Brexit and for that period of time that's requested? Mm -hmm. Have we any figures of what the, how much of the actual fleet we could be on, on about? take into consideration the lack of access, in particular for the macro sector? I realise the macro sector for 19 will be probably okay, but for 2020 in particular, there will be a huge issue regarding access to the actual UK markets where, or UK waters, where so much of the actual um, um, the product is actually um, caught. Could I also ask about how this could be policed in relation to the actual um, territorial water scenario? Um, if you did have a scenario that you did have a hard Brexit, mm -hmm. Um, Irish waters and UK waters, but Irish waters in particular, how could we as a nation now go into a policing regime along that line, along that border? Um, it's a, quite an extensive border and it's amazing that you see it in the map how large it is. 
Um, we only have a limited um, um, naval service itself. Do we have the potential, the capabilities to actually man that actual issue itself to ensure we don't have issues such as other maybe third world countries coming in regarding this issue and fishing in the waters itself and that actual issue itself and taking that into consideration the arrangements between the UK and Ireland um, there was a breakdown there five days ago to say the very least do you have any comment on how we can move forward in that space itself if you were to take I think it was uh, recommendation two of the proposal it's about uh, working with the UK and having re reciprocal arrangements. They're not in place at the moment regarding that kind of six mile limit that we talked about previously. I do realise the House Eleven member of would have stopped the recommendation that would have um, ensured that that would have been solved. Have you any recommendations on that or any insight into that issue? Thanks, Senator. Dr. Beamish, when you're ready, please. Okay. I'll, I'll do my best, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I'm all into one time. And, uh, <laughs> Please call me back when I miss something, and I undoubtedly will. Um, I'll maybe take them in the order in which people came. Um, I suppose the first thing, just to set the context, is it's like for many people in Brexit, we, it's very hard to be certain what you're dealing with. Right? So, I mean, the, understand first of all that the scenario that the UK government agreed and is working to still get adopted in the House of Commons, and the EU agreed with, and which Irish government supports, is one which in the fisheries area would lead to a transition period for the remainder of 2019 and 2020 where nothing would change. We would operate under the common fisheries policies as we have in the years coming up. And tax and quotas would be set in December 2019. UK would be outside the door, but they would be set and they would apply to the UK for 2020. Um, by the middle of 2020, the negotiations on the future relationship would have reached a certain point. The fisheries is part of that wider thing. Uh, and then a decision would have to be taken uh, in after that in 2020 on whether or not to extend a for, up to a further year, the transition period, to allow those negotiations to conclude. So that's the, the, the if you like, this, what they call the central case of the main approach that is still being pursued and sought after, right? So in the event that that happens, nothing will change immediately, right? So that, that could be the situation on the 1st of April, right? Uh, and that is what everybody is working towards. So therefore, that creates a lot of uncertainty. In the event that, um, in the event that that is not the situation and there isn't an agreement and there isn't an extension, to Article 50, because if there's an extension to Article 50, UK remains a member of the Union, therefore the CFP applies and things go on as normal for that period of extension, whatever that might be. Um, so um, so they're, they're the two first scenarios which might mean no change. Right? And then in the event of a disorderly or no deal Brexit, um, Technically, legally, once the UK would not be a member of the Union, the common fisheries policy doesn't apply. They become a third country, the same as Norway or Iceland, well, even more so because they're not in the EA, but further out even, right, Canada. Um, they become a third country, UK becomes a third country, uh, and therefore there is no automatic access for EU vessels to UK waters or UK vessels to EU waters. However, the geography doesn't change. The UK still needs to trade. It is likely that some form of discussion would be ongoing, and therefore, for how long and at what point would they decide to implement the prohibition on uh, access? Now, the second measure that we have in front of us here today, that, that you invited in on, which the Commission has made was based on the possibility that the UK would offer reciprocal access for 2019 on the basis of the tax and quotas that were agreed last December. So for the remainder of 2019, they would offer reciprocal access, and this second proposal that's in front of us here today creates, on the EU side, 
a legal framework whereby we could allow our vessels into the UK and UK vessels into us and manage everything. So while they would be technically outside the EU, this reciprocal access would be granted for 2019 and we would operate under the same tack and quota regimes that we have now. So that's one possibility that can happen in a no-deal Brexit. Right? And that's what that provision is, is there to enable in the event that that offer was made and agreed with the UK. So it's just 2019. So in that event, we wouldn't be needing temporary cessation and all that sort of thing to happen. Right? So it also depends on the time period. Fisheries are, many fisheries are seasonal, or their particular locations are seasonal. So the mackerel fishery is wrapping up as we speak. They'll have caught hold of their thing. They are traditionally dependent on catching a very large proportion in the UK zone, west of Scotland, north of Scotland. Uh, but that will be caught. That, that's in the, in the factories at this stage, right? So therefore, li very limited impact on that fleet in, uh, in 2019. So you're not talking about those being the ones in front in cessation. Other stocks, stocks are not managed on the basis of national areas. And they haven't been within the EU. So the stock would range across, say, the west of Scotland area that's in the UK zone and the west of Scotland area that's in our zone. It may well be that you can fish your quota entitlement still in our zone. Uh, so it could be that fishing activity could continue and it might be that, that if that was a migratory type stock it wouldn't have a big impact. Right? There are other stocks which are based on discrete grounds and if you're out you're off those grounds and if there was increased effort on the grounds that are in our zone that's spatially limited and that could have an impact right and that's where you might want to ease the effort on that ground right but the it's all about when this reality would become true at what point you would need to have to take that you don't necessarily have to do that on the 1st of April, right? Uh, it's not that everybody would stop fishing on the 1st of April. They just would have to be fishing in, in uh, EU waters. Um, so the other thing is, to what extent would other fleets increase fishing effort in our zone? Right? For some things that can happen, for other things it doesn't really make economic sense because of the size of the boat or the other opportunities they might have in French waters or whatever. So it, there's no script for this, right? We're trying to work this out uh, and, and plan for this scenario. Um, so it's quite complex. There's about 100 stocks that are shared with the UK, right? They're biological units that straddle the UK zone and the Irish zone. No matter what happens, they will have to continue to be shared and man jointly managed if we are to avoid damaging the stocks, right? So whatever future scenario happens, UK outside the Union, UK in transition, future Green, some sort of management arrangements will have to be worked out between the UK and the EU to manage those. There's no point in one side conserving the stock and the other side damaging the stock. You know, that doesn't work in fisheries. So we have models, we do things with Norway and others where we share stocks like that. Uh, people asked in terms of what would happen to the quota that the UK has. Well, that quota is an entitlement to fish a certain portion of the stock. Right? The UK has generally indicated that they would stick to those portions for 2019, those arrangements for 2019. Right? So they would fish only that amount, and the EU entitlements would be the same. That's the most likely scenario. Um, and then it would be negotiations after that as to what happens. But it isn't the case that a whole lot of quota becomes free. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, we're trying to manage the outtake from a given stock that's divided up between people. It isn't that you can share around some additional quota because if we're taking 100% of what's biologically sustainable to take at the moment, well, we can't share around another 40% and take 140%. You know, that's kind of mutually assured road that we don't want to go down. So, um, so in the short term, quota doesn't become available to anybody per se, right? UK 
some UK fishing industry obviously have ambition to take bigger share of the stocks in their area, and that does have implications. But that's a little further down the road. For 2019, the quota entitlements probably won't change. Um, so the issue then about um, access is that if the UK leaves the union, leaves the common fisheries policy, there won't be automatic access, and that's what the UK is saying, right? That's just a fact. It doesn't mean that they won't decide, perhaps, to grant reciprocal access for, for 2019, or we don't know how long that situation of no access would exist. Um, it isn't that it isn't without its problems for the UK. They, they need to access the market and have relations, and there's a whole lot of things going on that you know, impact their position as well. Um, so, so that's the general position. We're trying to deal with a variety of scenarios and prepare for a variety of scenarios, but there are a number of them which involve no change. Yeah. Go ahead, Jeff, briefly. Yeah. Um, if they were to grant access, say if the UK were to grant access, would they have to grant it to all of the EU countries or could a separate arrange, be, arrangement be made for, for Ireland or would it have to be for the other nine? The, the legal position in the European Union is that the European Commission negotiates with third countries. Mm. So if the UK is a third country, the European Commission will reach a European agreement with that third country. There won't be bilateral right, deals. Yes, um, and that has generally been seen by the Irish government as very much in Ireland's interest because it keeps the fisheries issues linked from across member states and that we have a lot of common issues, okay. you know, maybe in different places, but the issues are common. But it also is linked to the market and other issues that the UK may not be in a strong position as it is on fisheries. Right? Mm -hmm. So um, if, if the UK leaves the Union, it's the Commission who will be doing the negotiation. Um, whatever negotiation happens. Question? Yeah, uh, sorry. Could I just ask, like, I mean, how likely is it that the UK is going to have a reciprocal arrangement when basically 86% of their fish is caught within their waters, so that they have nothing, we have nothing to give them? As such, yeah. no. So I, I understand that you link it to, you've linked it to other arrangements. But how realistic is it that that would be the factor that will allow the EU to, or the UK to allow access? If the UK leads in disorderly Brexit, it isn't just in fisheries. You know, it's across yeah. all sectors. It's a whole variety of issues are going to be in play, and the EU is likely to take some sort of coordinated approach across those. Uh, the UK, in very simple terms, largely exports to the EU what it catches and imports what it eats. Uh, we're not terribly different ourselves in many ways, right? But uh, so the EU market is very important to the UK. Uh, and keeping that market and that trade going is, feeds all the way down to the fishermen, right? So it isn't something that you can do in isolation of your position in the market and the EU would be quite conscious of, of that situation. Um, I think, Deputy, you asked about tariffs, right? Um, first of all, it's not the same as in the agri-sector of, say, in beef or something like that, where you're very dependent on the UK market. Uh, Ireland isn't terribly dependent on the UK market in seafood. It is an important market, but it's not, it doesn't have the same dominance as it would have in beef. Uh, and secondly, the tariffs on fishery products are much lower. So tariffs on fishery products apply the other way as well, in that the UK is exporting into the EU, and they would hit those tariff barriers in terms of their exports into the EU market. We would be exporting into the EU market without that tariff barrier. So there's a lot of ways you can look at that, right? In terms of the tariffs, I mean, uh, at the high end, you have something like mackerel and herring at 20%. Uh, the more common white fish, around 7.5%, um, average something like 14%, right? So they're, they're at the lower end of some of the tariff ranges you would have heard on the agri-food side, you know? Um, so the tariff, yeah, if it processed product attracts higher tariffs, uh, and the UK would sell quite a bit of processed product into the EU market. So that's something they would be dealing with. Um, 
the tariff element hasn't been as dominant at all in the fisheries discussion as it would be in the other areas, right? It's not about the market so much. Um, the land bridge has been dealt with by other colleagues who are dealing with that and by the EU Commission, and it depends on how the UK deals with the product. Uh, but clearly fish, although it is perishable, isn't the only time-limited agri-food product going through the UK on land bridge. So land bridge is very important that it works and that it can work. Uh, but it's a bigger subject than I can go into here. Um, the, um, the issue about temporary cessation being proportionate, um, there's no script on this where, you know, Brexit is uh, uh, something new that we're going into, right? So what the Commission is doing in the proposal that's in front of us today is the Commission is creating a legal framework where temporary cessation can be used in a circumstances that nobody foresaw when the Maritime and Fishery Fund was being drawn up. If they don't change it, if they don't change by virtue of this proposal, you could not use temporary cessation because a member state was leaving. Right? So it's creating the possibility to use it. Um, and uh, the, I think the question was raised about the crew. Uh, it does provide in the MFF that people who have worked more than 100 and 20 days during the last two calendar years are eligible under the EMFF, right? For uh, payment under, the, under this. Um, the detail about this is, is that uh, the legal framework to enable it happen is what we're talking about today, right? Uh, the detail would then have to be drawn up in a detailed scheme. That could only be done when you know exactly how much access you have, how much access you don't have, which fisheries are gone through, which fisheries are severely impacted. Right? Not all fishing is the same, and, and you know that very well. And uh, also, when you have a sense, a proper sense at European level of what the displacement impacts are likely to be. So we're working very hard with the eight other member states impacted and with the Commission to try to draw up a factual assessment of where we think displacement will hit and what species and have the kind of fishery science advice as to what the likely impact of that would be, that increase in effort. Right? As I say, if the stock is migratory, it may have no, no long-term biological impact if you increase the fishing in one particular area of the stock rather than another. You know? So. so um, so all of that's being assessed at the moment. Uh, there isn't any existing coordination mechanism for how you would determine what's the proportion of reduction and how it will be done, and that work is ongoing with the Commission. Uh, the fisheries are shared, they're European fisheries, and what Minister Creed has been saying is he needs a European response. You know, one member state on their own cannot, we can't set the rules for the French fleet or the the Dutch fleet or the Spanish fleet fishing in our zone, it is a common policy. So we want a common response, right? So that, that thing. Um, the question was raised in terms of the funding. Um, the Commission, and I think that's what I said in my opening statement, the Commission is saying that it must come from the existing national envelopes. Uh, the existing national envelopes ha are already programmed and allocated out to different programmes. We're working to spend our, our envelopes. Um, so we haven't envisaged a scheme for tie-up cessation. So uh, I think the issue of funding is going to have to be considered both at government level and at national and at EU level as to how and that will happen, I think, later in the month as we get closer to whatever the reality might be. Um, so um, I think, uh, Deputy Kenny, you... Um, quoted, taken away, and we dealt with that tariffs. Uh, in terms of what new arrangements would happen in the event that the UK was out, and the UK was out permanently, um, there would have to be still negotiations on how to manage fisheries with the UK. It's just not possible to coexist in 100 shared fisheries without working out arrangements for how you manage those, right? And those arrangements, uh, the national position here would be should not impact on relative stability. You know, we should keep the shares that we have uh, in those, but we would have to agree 
for example, within the common fisheries policy at the moment, we're all working to a shared objective to bring our stocks to maximum sustainable yield levels by 2020. Would that be the target that the UK would adopt if they were out? That would have to be negotiated with them because we would be jointly managing those stocks. So you'd have to agree what's your target that you're trying to manage to and then agree your outtakes. So there will be fisheries negotiations in some form or other, no matter what happens. Um, and um, I, we don't envisage new negotiations on tax and quotas for 2019. But we can't be certain on anything, but we don't envisage it at the moment, right? The UK, insofar as they have made any comments sort of consistently, have seemed to have suggested that they will stick to the tax and quota of 2019. Only for 2019, but we'll we see what happens then. Um, um, and there's, there's, no, there's no arrangement or no deal there. And they agree to keep the, the various um, levels of quota with, in other words, they, they on, a, on, a, on an ad hoc basis, agree to keep the terms of the, of the common fisheries policy for the time being, which is really what, what you're saying that probably do into the future. Uh, what way is there, or what obligation do they have for to report any of that back? Uh, and the other thing in regard to the, because it's clear, like from discussions earlier, that, that, that the, the, all over the world there's always an arrangement with neighbouring countries. Uh, and obviously the EU, EU has other neighbours that are outside of the EU as well in other parts yeah. where, where, they, where they share seas. Yes. And, and is there templates there which would give us some notion or some at least guidance as to what kind of, of uh, arrangement we, we might be able to, to work out in the future? Yeah. Yeah. There, there are different models. Um, and this is probably unique because of the scale of what we're dealing with here, in that 100 shared stocks is covers a very vast suite of what's available in European fisheries, right? So we haven't got anything of that scale. We do a smaller scale arrangements with Norway. And how do we, we share information on catches and all of that? Because both sides need to know that the other is respecting whatever has been agreed. So all of the catch statistics and that stuff are shared in the fisheries that are shared, say, with Norway, right? So you would envisage a scenario where UK and EU would still be sharing in, in an agreed arrangement, right? Not in a, it's not necessarily an agreed arrangement, would have to be able to share uh, information on catches, make sure that both sides were doing their controls, et cetera, et cetera. Right? You, you'd have to have joint confidence in the management arrangements you were agreeing to, right? Um, but None of that, nothing of that scale has been done up to now, so it would be quite a different landscape in terms of how you would do it. Right? And in many ways, it would probably supplant what is currently the December Fisheries Council, because many of our stocks would be determined through whatever bilateral negotiation would happen with the UK. In regard to the, the, the export of, of fish, a, lo a lot of the fish that, is caught, that the British vessels catch, basically they export. They, they, they're not, yes. they're not. They're a bit like us, although they're, they're an island nation. They don't eat a lot of fish, and and they export a lot of it. And from that point of view, if the main export market for them is clearly the EU and EU countries, and they will be they'll be f facing a tariff when they do that, whereas we won't. And the the you'd imagine that the, the, when they go to negotiate, they'll have to they'll have to bear all that in mind as well. So. Is the, the and I, I, you know, the people talk about the doomsday scenario, but I wonder when we actually get into it, and you actually sit down and you examine the whole lot, uh, and that's one of the, the the sort of the big questions when you step back from it all and you look at how, how much of a of a huge um, positive is this going to be for the British fishing industry, or they, they, they seem to think that the Brexit is going to bring them a bonanza. I, I just wonder about that. When you step back from it and look at the whole lot, is, yeah. is it possible that the British could find that you know their vessels may have access to more fish because that the, the quotas won't apply? Yeah. But when they actually go to, to realise that they might be able to sell those fish, yeah. that it, it may not be any benefit at all. Well, again, it's hard to draw it down to one one conclusion. But the 70% of UK seafood is exported to the EU. Um, if you're in a shellfish industry which is non-quota, 
when you're exporting to the EU, you will face tariffs. Uh, and it's non-quota, so you don't get any benefit in quota, if you like. Uh, that's what's there. Uh, the perception would be that fishermen who are fishing on certain quota fisheries where they perceive the UK share is low relative to the fisher, and they perceive they will get a benefit through increased quota. But you're correct, it's still sold largely into the EU. The UK tends to import cod, salmon, tiger prawns, etc., for their domestic market, um, tuna, sorry, and, uh, um, and tends to export a lot of the other fish that are caught. Um, so, so it depends on what kind of fishery you're in as to whether you see a balance of advantage to you or a balance of disadvantage. But of course, fishery is a zero-sum game. If somebody gets a bigger share, somebody else gets a smaller share. We'll be very conscious of that from the Irish perspective. Um, um, the EU, our, our position would be, and the EU position to date has been that the EU, in any future negotiations with the EU, would negotiate on the basis of the current uh, access and quota sharing arrangements. That the national position here and the EU position has been that the UK leaves the what it has, uh, it retains it, and if that is access into EU for certain fisheries and EU has access into the UK for certain fisheries, that that's what the UK leaves with. Now, it isn't necessarily the perception, as you say, in the UK industry. Right? Um, but all of that is in, into the future, into future negotiations. Uh, so no matter what happens here, there's going to be fisheries negotiations you have to anticipate over the reasonably long period could be forward that are going to be very important for the fishing industry here it will be conducted through the EU central negotiation, uh, in much like uh, Michel Barnier has done so far in, in this. Um, has a member states whenever, whenever work and, and feed into that process. It isn't that they're removed for it. You know. uh, sorry, Deputy. Yeah. Sorry, can I just go back. Oh, just uh, two things. Um, you talk about the, the compensation arrangements if you're working over 100 days in the fishing industry. So would that include fish factory workers as well? Um, I just wonder, wonder in relation to that because, I mean, obviously, in Killy Beggs, would be severely impacted on the loss of, of mackerel if it, if, it was, if it happened. You know, so it would be very interesting to see how that, that could, they could benefit from that. Um, and also, just, I mean, you talk, I mean, it's EU waters you talk about, and you talk about the, if, uh, there is no, there is basically outside the 16 mile, or the 12 mile limit, there isn't any Irish waters, it's UK waters, in the context of, the, of what we're talking about here, really, as, as such, and you're working it on the basis of a UK basis, really, isn't that how you work it? Each member state has a 200 mile zone, mm. uh, and what's been talked about here is UK zone out to 200 miles losing access to that. It's one of the potential scenarios, right? Um, so it isn't... Some countries have access in the 6 to 12, uh, or in some cases in some areas inside 6, but this is about, about 200. Yeah, but where's the Irish zone? 200 miles as well. Out. We're in the Irish zone. Uh, I've heard you before talk about that, that there is no Irish zone that it's European. The, yeah, 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 zone. OK, yeah, but this is kind of a philosophical conversation. Uh, yeah. Legally, under the Common Fisheries Policy, the, the waters are deemed Euro European waters. Mm -hmm. um, I know everybody always refers to Irish waters, that's the way we do. And our responsibilities are for control and management in that 200 mile zone, which is managed under uh, EU Common Fisheries Policy. Mm -hmm. So it's a complex debate you could have. But the UK would not be subject to the CFP, no, no, that's no, the no, point. So they, yeah. will, they will manage their own zone, as they say. Um, the, the details of what temporary cessation, who might apply to all of that, has to be determined because we don't know what we're, to what extent there's cessation, what is impacted, what is displaced, what can't be caught here, all that work is going on behind the scene, uh, and if required, uh, but it won't happen on day one, you know. Um, the focus here is on the, um, vessels uh, and the uh, impact on the vessels and the impact of the crewmen uh, is what the EMFF is focused on. 
Um, the general perception is that the workers in the processing sector will be under the social insurance scheme. Um, uh, and um, the, the work is often seasonal in any event in a lot of the factories. So in the pelagic factories it's seasonal. Um, so, but as I say, the, the primary impacts are not going to be pelagic in 2019. You know, it's been extremely busy for the, and that is the agreed management arrangement for the national quota as well was to facilitate uh, the catching of that quota in the first three months of the year. Um, so the focus is likely to be much more on the prawn fleet and some of the whitefish fleets uh, where they would be more impacted um, if we get to that situation. But you, you envisage that, that fish factory workers or people who work with the fish, it would be the social welfare that they would deal with rather than... The um, MFF is fo focused on the vessels and the crews. Hmm. Um, now there may be other assistance to factories and so on that are impacted um, through other mechanisms, um, uh, restructuring aid and things like that. Hmm. Yeah. yeah. That's the owners, it'll be no mention the workers. There's, there's wider things outside the CFP that, that will impact on perhaps restructuring aid and so on for companies. Um, so, um, I know the question of the Deputy Kenny. Somebody else. Sorry. Oh, sorry, still a short comment, Walsh. I, I didn't respond to you. Sorry, okay, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. Go ahead, yeah, go ahead. I'm asked in terms of Secretary of State Michael Gove and what might have changed or not. We don't know if it's changed or not. The, in, the, in the opening address, I said that the most recent notice says that there wouldn't be automatic access. That's a statement of fact, a legal fact, if the UK falls outside the EU. But I suppose the important word there is automatic. Right? So there wouldn't be automatic access, but the UK could choose to give reciprocal access for 2019. So I'm just supposing two notices. It doesn't mean that they're necessarily inconsistent. It's still within the discretion of the UK to give the reciprocal access for 2019. And the proposal we have from the Commission here is simply so that we, we as EU would be in a position to take up that offer if such an offer happened. Right? If. So, um, beyond that, I can't guess what Secretary of State Gold's thinking would be. <laughs> uh, um, okay. Yeah. Um, and just the impounding of the boats last week, do you think that has had an impact? Well, uh, that matter has been dealt, the specific cases have been dealt with in the courts. Um, not to say on that. Uh, I think the uh, Minister Creed and the Taoiseach have both spoken openly about what they wish to do in terms of legislation, um, and um, I don't think I want to add to what they've said. Okay, I appreciate that that. Yeah. So that will be a matter for the Oireachtas uh, in terms of that legislation. Okay, thank you. Deputy Kenny has a question. I was just going to ask in, in regard to particularly the, the Scottish farm salmon sector is, is very large yes. and, and have a lot of exports, and I imagine a lot of their exports is going to the EU. What, um, or have we any indication as to how they are, how they are um, viewing Brexit and what, what situation they're going to be in? Is, 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 are, are the tariffs for that sector high? Is it going to be uh, um, a difficulty for that sector to cope after Brexit if it, if it comes again to Brexit we're expecting? So it depends on the preparation, I think. Um, yeah, the fresher chilled is 2%. Uh, no, I think the smoked is higher. Yeah. Got it here. If you smoke or any additional factor. Like, uh, um, certainly, I have seen, uh, we don't deal directly with the Scottish salmon industry, but I have seen commentary indicating that they do have concerns about market access. Uh, they would export quite heavily to European market, uh, and it is a very big industry in Scotland. Yeah. Uh, so they would be worried in that respect. Yeah. I think you've covered all. Okay. We're all happy. Right. Dr. Binish, thank you very much for coming in before today and give us a sure. very detailed explanation of why it's a very technical and uncertain issue at the moment. I'm sure we'll probably be dealing with this at some time in the very near future again.
Well, thank you very much for coming forward today. As there is no further business, the meeting stands adjourned until next Tuesday, the 12th of March, at 3:30 p.m. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you, members. Okay.